Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, what we do here is we open our Bibles and for an hour we just we read through it. We study it line by line, verse by verse, chapter by chapter. We go through a whole book. Not in one night, but we do make a dent. Uh, the goal is always a chapter at night. Sometimes we get there, sometimes we don't. But we just start and we go and we see what the Lord has for us in his word. And tonight we're starting a brand new study in the book of Nehemiah. And uh, somebody told me that Nehemiah is the book all about building walls before wall building was cool, you know. And so that's what we're looking at today, the book of Nehemiah. Uh, just a quick reminder, if there's anything that you're interested in getting involved with, um, I would encourage you to check out our information desk. There's all kinds of things to sign up for. But in particular, we have a class coming up called Shepherd 101, and it's all about getting oriented uh, with the church here. You know, what is going on at the church, some basic history on the church, ways that you can serve here, just kind of learning what it means to be a part of this fellowship. There will also be offered later on Shepherd 102, which is all about the Calvary distinctives and what makes Calvary Chapel unique among all the church groups that are out there. And then after that is Shepherd 103, which is all about how you can discover your spiritual gifts and serve in the church. You do not need to take uh, 101 before, you know, 102. It's not a prerequisite or anything, you know. You can take whatever you want. You can take three and then go back to one. Or if you know what's going on in the church, you know your gifts, but you're curious about the distinctives, you can go to 102. They really are individual standalone courses. We just numbered them, you know, one, two, and three. But you don't have to go in that order. The plan is that, uh, again, this month is January, we'll have Shepherd 101, February will be 102, March is 103, April will be 101 again, and we're going to continue that pattern through the year. So if you miss one, you can sign up for the next, but it's a really good opportunity to learn a little bit more about the church, about yourself, about the things God's put in your life and uh, the gifts that he's given you and ways that you can apply those and serve. It's a great opportunity, so I do want to encourage you to check that out. Also, our book of the month this month is called Jesus Revolution. And if you were with us over the summer, you might remember that one Wednesday night, we just took a field trip. We went down to the Pottstown Theater. We bought out the theater that was showing Jesus Revolution. And we just said, anybody who wants to come can come. We had a bunch of people from the church show up. We had some people from the community come out that we hadn't met yet. Some people randomly show up and they were there to see the movie. And we just told the theater, just you know, let them in with us and that's fine. And they did, and we were able to go and kind of see the origin story of Calvary Chapel and the Jesus movement and the Jesus revolution. Well, that book is now our book of the month for uh, the month of January. So I believe this uh, is going to be the second to last weekend that we have that is our book of the month, but it is available. I think it's $15 that includes your sales tax, but it is a good read. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, it's certainly available in our store tonight. Um, or you can ask any one of the pastors and be happy to help you with that. But all that is there for you. Well, tonight we're in the book of Nehemiah. And uh, if you would, let's pray. Father, we do come before you tonight in an attitude of worship and yearning, Lord. We, we gather in the middle of the week and a lot of people say this is crazy. Why would you go to church on a Wednesday? Why not just stay home? It's cold outside. Why not just sit by the fire or under a blanket or stay on the couch and watch TV or whatever it is that everyone else is doing? But Lord, they don't know the things that we know, and, and that is that stopping midweek like this and pausing our life and coming in to dive into your word, that this is filling, this is life-changing, this is soul-nourishing kind of stuff. And so, Father, we come to you with that desire to nourish us, to grow us. Lord, please take this time and speak to our hearts and speak to each and every one of our lives in the way that you know that we need to hear it. Lord, I pray that you'd pour out your spirit among us tonight as we open your word. This wouldn't just be another Wednesday, not just another study, but Lord, this would be the one that truly changes us in a way that we've been needing for so long. 
So, Father, I pray that you would do that. I pray that you would give us ears to hear, give us minds to understand and hearts to receive, and feet to live out your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, we're starting the book of Nehemiah. If you don't know where that is, uh, it's probably in your index somewhere. And if you still don't know where it is, you can go to 2 Chronicles and turn right one. You end up in the book of Ezra, turn right again. You end up in the book of Nehemiah. I want to start the study by reading a verse, a couple of verses out of the book of 1 Corinthians. You don't have to turn there, but I'll just read them. In 1 Corinthians 1, Paul writes this. For you see your calling, brethren. That not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put shame to the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put shame to the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him... You are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I read that as we begin our study in Nehemiah, because if I had to give a theme to this book, it would be that passage. That God uses the unexpected people of the world, the ordinary people, people like me and people like you and the people that others would look at and just look past to do mighty things in his name. This book is a book that many people have looked past. And it's a person, Nehemiah, that many have looked past. And yet when we open it and as we study it over the next several weeks, I think we're going to see that God has used this ordinary man, Nehemiah, to do mighty things in his name. The book is an interesting one because even though it seems to fall right in the middle of the Old Testament, chronologically speaking, this is the last book of the Old Testament. And so after the book of Nehemiah closes, there is what we call the intertestamental period. It's 400 years where not much is written. I mean, God is certainly at work. In that 400 years, uh, we see somebody by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes. You'll remember him from our Daniel study. He rises to power in Syria, and he takes over control of Jerusalem, and he starts abusing the Jews in ways that people had never seen before. He killed them. He forbade the worship. He took pig entrails and dumped them all over the temple, all over the holy places. He said nobody could teach the scriptures to kids. And if they were caught, he took the mothers who were discipling their children and he cooked them alive in a cauldron of oil that he had on top of a fire in the temple grounds. And so he was really a terrible guy. He is the Old Testament version of the Antichrist. So that's Antiochus Epiphanes. And from that period of time... Judas Maccabeus will rise up and lead the Jews in a revolt, the Maccabean revolt, that basically gets rid of Antiochus Epiphanes, reclaims Jerusalem, and then on their way into the city, they celebrate by lighting a lamp that only had enough oil to last one night, but then miraculously lasted eight. That's where the celebration of Hanukkah comes from. But all of that happens in between the book of Nehemiah and the beginning of the book of Matthew, chronologically speaking. I know in your Bible, Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament, so literarily that is true, but chronologically, it is this. Not a lot of people know that, and that's okay, but it does put it in a very interesting place, because the things that we're about to read about are the things that Daniel prophesied. For example, It is, I believe, in Daniel 9 that it says, Now therefore, and this is one of Daniel's prophecy, and you might remember it from our study, Therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. That is a prophecy of the book of Nehemiah. 
That's going to be a conversation that we see Nehemiah have with his king, Artaxerxes, the king of Babylon. And the king will tell Nehemiah to go rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. From that period forward, there will be 70 weeks of years, 70 times 7. And that many years it will be, and historians have calculated that from the very beginning of that command, which is probably around March or April of the 20th year of Artaxerxes, well documented in history, but from that point forward, 490 years, you, f- you find yourself at the very week, in fact, many say the very day that Jesus rode the donkey into Jerusalem and he was received as a hero as they poured the palm branches down in front of him and yelled, Hosanna, it would be that week that Jesus is arrested and Jesus is crucified. And so this is that. This is that prophecy that we read about several weeks ago in the book of Daniel. Understand that the namesake of the book is a man named Nehemiah. This is an autobiography in a lot of ways. Uh, We don't get any details about his early life, but it just kind of starts with this portion of his life. And it's going to tell us all kinds of things about Nehemiah. For example, Nehemiah is a Jew. And although there have been already two returns to Jerusalem since Babylon took captive the Jews, including Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, when that happened under Nebuchadnezzar, um, 70 years would pass that the Jews would be in exile. And after 70 years, they would start to return. And they returned under two men, Zerubbabel the first time and then Ezra the second time. But Nehemiah doesn't go with them. He's been born into captivity, and so he's a Jew, but he's never seen Jerusalem. And yet he's seen wave after wave of his fellow countrymen go home, and he's curious about that. He's got a longing for his homeland that that he's never seen before. It's going to tell us that Nehemiah is the cupbearer for his king, Artaxerxes. Now, depending on what kingdom you lived in and what era you lived in and who your king was, that title meant very different things. If you were a cupbearer in Persia, for example, you were little more than a throwaway slave. I mean, you were the one that they tested everything on. All the drinks the king would drink, you'd drink first. All the food he would eat, you would eat first. That way, if you died, the king would know there's poison in it and he wouldn't eat it. But if you died, there was a whole line of other cupbearers that they would just use as like laboratory mice to just conduct these experiments to see if the king's food was, was safe. But that's, that's really all they were. Slaves in shackles with a very short life expectancy. And uh, that, that was just about it. If, if one died, they just move them to the side and they'd bring another one in. In Persia, that was the case if you were a cupbearer. In Babylon, it's completely different. As we will see, Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. But as such... He serves not as a throwaway slave, but more as the chief of the secret service. Nehemiah is the senior most protector of the king. He's more like the guy standing next to the president when he's giving his speech. You know, the guy who's willing to jump in front of that guy and and take a bullet for him. He's the one in the Oval Office. He's the one in the Situation Room. He's the one following him to Air Force One. He's the one that's always talking into his cuff. He's the one that you look at and you realize his job is to protect the president with his very life. But until the day that his job is, is done, he has so much power and he has so much respect in a position of honor, in a position of incredible trust. Nehemiah is going to have the ear of the king in ways that no one else does. In fact, in the second chapter, there's even a scene, and we'll read about it, where Nehemiah is alone with the king and the queen in their private residence, and they're having a conversation. I mean, just imagine the kind of trust that would have to be given to this individual to allow him, not just in the king's presence, not just around the king's food, but in his private home, in his living room with his wife, where there's no one else. That's Nehemiah. He was a rich man because of his position. He had a lot of power and authority and say so. And so he was able to issue orders and decrees. He was the one that would be in charge of all the procedures and all the pomp and circumstances of the king's court. 
He was the one who decided who could be there and who couldn't be there. I mean, Nehemiah is no slouch servant. So that's the guy that is writing about his own life. He is in a very unique position. And I say that because he's a Jew, but he's serving at the right hand or probably the left hand of the king in a way that we've only seen in a few other people in all of the Bible. Joseph, for example, serving Pharaoh of Egypt. Very similar kind of relationship where Joseph was promoted to second in command of the whole kingdom. Or when you get to Moses and Pharaoh and how Moses, even though he was a Hebrew baby and rescued as an early child, he was adopted by the Pharaoh and by the palace. And so he was raised as one of their own. But he likewise had a very unique position of authority and power and circumstance. And similar to that, Nehemiah serves the king of Babylon. As I said, Nehemiah has never seen Jerusalem, but he's got a heart for it. And so that's really what this book is all about, the heart that he has for God's people. This book can be divided into basically two sections. And in Daniel, it was very similar. Remember, there was the person of Daniel. It was all about his life. And then the second half was the prophecy of Daniel. And that's where we read about Nehemiah and, and these events. Well, Nehemiah's book can likewise be divided into two sections. Chapters 1 through 6 are all about physical reconstruction. He's going to go to Jerusalem. He's going to see it in ruins. He's going to start the project of rebuilding walls and bringing some dignity back to this city. But then chapters 7 on through 13 are all about spiritual reconstruction. Those two always have to go hand in hand. You know, there's a lot of people wondering why it is that they don't see, they don't feel like they're getting any closer to God, or they don't feel like God is speaking to them, or they have no idea why their life hasn't improved ever since they've come to the Lord, or ever since they've tried to start doing things differently. But then you look at their, at their life, and there's been no physical reconstruction. Sure, spiritually, they surrendered, they gave their life to the Lord, and then they did all those things, but physically, they've done nothing. They've got the same friends, the same habits. They're doing the same things for entertainment. They're spending their money on the same things. And so as long as there is spiritual or physical ruin in a person's life, that way, behaviorally speaking, it's going to be very hard to have spiritual reconstruction. They have to go hand in hand. One of the main teachings in repentance is just that very thing. We want a different life. We want different results. It's not enough to just say we're sorry and keep going, but rather we have to turn around and we have to make better choices and we have to make changes in our life. And so that's a lot of what this book is. Spiritual reconstruction and then followed by, I'm sorry, physical reconstruction followed by spiritual reconstruction. But that's what this is. It's a book of a man, a cupbearer, a man who has no talent, no qualifications whatsoever to go and build this city wall, who's going to be called by God and given a burden laid on his heart for the people of God to go do a job that everyone is going to say, you're not the right person. You don't have the qualifications. You're not an engineer. You're not a military strategist. You don't have anything behind your name that says you should be the one doing this. And yet that is exactly the man God is going to use. As I said, if I could pick a theme, it would be 1 Corinthians, where Paul says God chose the weak things of the world to bring down the strong, and he chose Nehemiah to build up his city. And so all of that brings us to the beginning of chapter 1. And it begins like this. The words of Nehemiah, the son of of Hekeliah. Nehemiah is a Jew, as I said, but you've got to remember as we start this study that, that he's never been to Jerusalem. He's never seen it before. He's never stepped foot in the city walls. He's never breathed this air. He was born in Babylon as uh, the descendant of somebody who may be the descendant or maybe was an original um, captive of the Babylonian Jerusalem war. He's heard stories. He's heard legends. He's heard all about Moses and all about 
you know, the law and all about Joseph. And he's heard all about everything that God did in Israel and Egypt. But then he also learned about how Israel had sinned and God allowed Babylon to come in and conquer. And so for 70 years, they would be in captivity. And, and you might remember from Daniel the reason it was so long. It's because for 70 Sabbath years, Israel had failed to let the ground lie fallow. Remember, that was God's command. He said, you can plant for six years, but on the seventh year, give the land rest so it can recover. They didn't do that. They just kept on going business as usual. And so what God is doing is he's bringing some recompense uh, for, for that infraction. And so for 70 years, which are the 70 Sabbath years that they did not give the land, God's going to remove them from the land so the land can recover. So that's where Nehemiah is coming in from. He's never been there. It's been generations since anyone was there. But now they're all starting to return. One group went back with Zerubbabel. Another group went back with Ezra. Word is starting to return. But we're introduced to this man who's a Jew, who has a longing for his heritage, who cares about those things. He cares about the coat of arms on the wall. He cares about his last name. He cares about where he came from and the stories of his parents and his grandparents. And he's never been there, but, but he wants to be there. He wants to visit it. He wants to see the things that he hears about. And so that's Nehemiah. It came to pass in the month of Chislev, which is um, in the Babylonian calendar. That's our November, December. So right about this time of year, a little bit earlier maybe, in the 20th year, and we're going to learn in chapter 2, that's the 20th year of the reign of Artaxerxes, which puts our calendar right about 445, maybe 444 BC. It all depends on how you count the year of ascension. A lot of groups would say, well, the year of ascension is just that, and then after that is your first year. Some groups would say it's just your first year when you get the throne. Either way, we're 444, 445 BC. And this is coming in right after on the tail end of, of Daniel. And so it came to pass in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the citadel. So Shushan is, is a place, again, it's wintertime. It's a place they would go when it would be a little cold outside, um, you know, kind of a retreat to warmer weather. This is not the capital Babylon. This is, you know, like Camp David for the king, you know, a place that he would go and just hang out until the weather would pass. And so he's there in Shushan the citadel that Hanani, one of my brothers, one of my brethren, another Jew, another Hebrew, came with men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped who had survived the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. So he knows that the groups have gone back, but he's wondering, hey, what's, what's going on on the home front? You know, how is the rebuilding going? How's the reoccupation going? You know, did they get things started yet? Do they have another government yet? You know, they didn't have internet. They didn't have Twitter and all this other stuff. So the only time you got word of anything would be when somebody returned. I was reading that, and it made me think of a story. Of a, It's a true story. There's an island in the South Pacific. It's so remote that nobody goes there. And during World War II, it was occupied by the Japanese. But here's the thing. Nobody bothered telling them the war was over in 1945. So when Americans showed up, like in the 50s, they thought they were still at war, and they started shooting at everybody. And you, you would think, well, that kind of thing can't happen today, except there's another island in the South Pacific, exactly the same thing. And I think it wasn't until the 60s or 70s that they even knew the war was over. And it wasn't until, you know, many years later that they understood that the atomic age had come and people had left, you know, Earth and gone to the moon. There are still places like that in the world, but it was the way of life back then. So he's asking, what's going on at home? And they said to me, here's the news. The survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in great distress and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem is also broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. That's not very heartwarming news to hear about your, your fatherland, your motherland, your home, the home of your ancestors. To hear that everybody's gone home, but it turns out it's terrible. 
that life is miserable. And, and I think this is a great illustration for brokenness in life and how very often what happens when things get neglected is they start falling apart. The Jews hadn't been home in 70 years. They show up. The city's been ravaged. The war had destroyed the city and burned down the homes, burned down the gates, burned down the walls. And they're coming back to that bombed out kind of place. We don't know what that looks like here in America personally because all of our wars are fought overseas. You know, our bombers, and I was just hearing a story the other day about a stealth bomber that had run a mission back during the Afghan war where it took off from a base here in the U.S. and it flew over the Atlantic all the way into Afghanistan, dropped its payload, refueled along the way, of course, but then came back in a 24-hour mission. I mean, for us, the war is always on the news. It's always overseas. It's always someone else's yard, someone else's home. We don't know what it's like to walk down the street and see bomb craters and to see houses with sandbags all around them and, and drills for, for bombings and air raids and things like that. So it's a very foreign concept. And it was foreign to Nehemiah as well because living in Babylon, living in the palace around the king, he wouldn't have seen this stuff there either. But going home, that's exactly what they see. You know, right now Israel's at war again. And Israel's not a very big country. So when its air force takes off at its air bases and, and launches attacks against Hamas and the Gaza Strip, you know, they're launching this ordinance from within Israel's airspace. They don't even cross the border. They just launch and then they go home. But they never actually cross that international line because it's such a small area. There are neighborhoods where half an hour down the road there's a war zone, but half an hour away are schools and kids and soccer games and, and shopping. And it's just something we don't really understand as Americans because, again, the wars are always overseas. They're always at a distance. But now Nehemiah is seeing and hearing news that his home, the home he's never seen but he wants to see, has been destroyed in this war. There are no gates. There are no walls. And I think that's a great illustration for life. Because if there's no walls in life, if there's no gates in life, if there's no gates in your life or in your heart or in your mind or in your behavior or your home, there's no way to control what comes in. There's no way to keep the bad things out. There's no way to keep people from encroaching upon you in unhealthy ways. There's no way to deal with temptation. There's no way to keep the, the devil's schemes back. There's no way to put up a defense against spiritual warfare if there are no, war, no walls and no gates and, and no defenses. And so here we have a city, the holy city, Jerusalem. I mean, this is God's gem in the world, and it lies in ruin, and the groups that have returned there are having an awful, awful, terrible time. There needs to be walls. You know, the Bible says, so far as you are able, live peaceably with all. But sometimes the all are not willing to live peaceably with you. In those cases, we are told to be as savvy as serpents, and as innocent as doves. Putting up defenses does not mean that we're walling off from the world, but it does mean that we have the capacity to say, you know what, we're going to put a gate at the entrance of our life. We're going to put a gate around the church, and we're going to say that all people are welcome, but not all things are welcome. Not all concepts are welcome. Not all influences are welcome. Sure, we want all people to come through these gates, but we don't want the influences and the corruption of the world to come through these gates. And if we don't have these walls around life, these, these metaphorical barriers that keep these things out, then anything can come in and anything can ravage and there's no way to know the difference. And so Nehemiah is seeing this. And he's hearing about it. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So it was when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Remember, Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem. But boy, he has a heart for Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He has a heart for God's people. He has a heart for the broken. He has a heart for the injured and a heart for the downtrodden. And, you know, God gave him this burden, gave him a heart for people that he's never met, a place that he's never been, 
Maybe you have a heart like that. Maybe you have a heart for people in a country that you've heard of, you've seen on the news, but we have no capacity to physically get there, and, and we would love to do so much to help them, and yet we're an ocean away. Or maybe you have a heart for people in the community that you really have no practical way of running into, but, but your heart breaks for them. You know, I hate seeing those commercials on TV of kids walking through uh, these streets in other nations where like, they've got no shoes, you know what I mean? And like the houses are all run down and they're just huts and dirt floors and they don't have enough to eat. And like I see that stuff. And it just breaks my heart. I look at my kids and I think, you know what, by, you know, but by the grace of God. And I think, you know, that, that's someone's kid. That's someone's, you know, miracle. That, that was a baby that a mother delivered into this world. And the doctor gave this baby to this mom and parents who probably never thought that they'd be in this situation. And yet there they are. They're born into an area. You can't control where you're born. You can't control the circumstances of your government. But there they, I, I hate seeing that stuff. It breaks my heart. Nehemiah is hearing this, and it's just breaking his heart. When he heard the words that he wept to care for others, he mourned for them. You know, I think sometimes it's just a good thing to just stop and, and not just appreciate the gifts that we have, but to sympathize as, as best we can and try to empathize as best we can with the plight of others. To just say, you know what? Um, You know, we're sitting here in a room and we're able to gather and open our Bible. There are churches around the world who are doing this very thing. They're they're waiting for the government to come into the building. They're waiting for the police to come in, to drag them out, to execute them just for studying the Bible. There's places where they would just love to have a home with heat and food in the refrigerator. And, you know, we throw out leftovers and, you know, not trying to put anybody on, on a guilt trip. We do the same thing. But sometimes to just stop and realize and, and appreciate and, and weep and mourn for others. And so that's what Nehemiah is doing. And I said, I pray. So he prayed. That, that's his instinct. You know, what's our instinct? I love that. Nehemiah is going to pray. He doesn't just sit there. He doesn't call himself a victim. He doesn't insult people. He doesn't say, well, you know what? Uh, all, all the people in Babylon are to blame. He goes, no, Lord. I'm going to pray to you. I'm going to give this to you. That's his instinct when things are bothering him. I wonder, is our instinct to pray that quickly? To say, Lord, I don't know what to do here, but I'm going to pray. I've got a little thing on my desk. It says, pray first. And I look at that and I go, yeah, that's right. Because how many times do we pray last? How many times do we go through everything that we can do and it doesn't work and we're frustrated and someone says, well, all you can do now is pray about it. It's like, well, that's what we should have started with. And then probably most of this would have been different, or our mindset would have been different. But we leave prayer for last. Nehemiah prays first. And I said, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O great and awesome God, you who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments, please let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open, that you may hear the prayer of your servant, which I pray before you now day and night for the children of Israel, your servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Both my father's house and I have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, nor the ordinances which you commanded your servant Moses. So Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem, but he knows the law. He knows the statutes. He knows the commandments. He knows what God expects of God's people, whether you're in Israel or in Babylon or in Pennsylvania or in Australia or wherever you are. God's word is still God's word, and it doesn't change because the zip code does. And so Nehemiah says, you know what? I have broken your law. He doesn't just blame everybody. He recognizes that that he has a role to play in all of this. Even though he wasn't there when it happened, he recognizes, you know what? He's not been perfect. It's very easy to look at the world and say, you know what? All of those people are just nuts. And they're ruining everything. And, and this generation is ruining everything. And the people in Washington, they're ruining everything. And you know, Putin is ruining everything. And China and North Korea and Iran and all these other places, they're just ruining everything. And it's all those corrupt people and it's all those selfish people Nehemiah says, that's me. 
I have a role in that. Yeah, everyone has sinned, but so have I. And I, and I just love that about him, that his instinct is to say, not, first of all, look at them, but Lord, look at me. I've broken your law. I have a, a responsibility to claim in this mess. He doesn't blame others. He looks to himself. Remember, he says, verse 8, I pray the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations, which is exactly what happened. They were unfaithful. They were idolatrous, Israel was. They didn't give the land the seventh year of Sabbath, not to mention all the other things they were doing. It wasn't like it was just that one thing and God evicted them. They had made idols. They weren't keeping commands. They were... Uh, fornicating, they were intermarrying with pagan nations, they were adopting pagan worship, they were doing all kinds of terrible things in addition to abusing the land and one another. And so God said, look, if you're going to act like that, then I'm going to send you into the world. Act like the world will send you into the world. And so that's exactly what happened. But if you, verse 9, return to me and keep my commands and do them, Though some of you were cast out to the farthest part of the heavens, yet I will gather them from there and bring them to the place which I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. Now these are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. And let your servant prosper this day, I pray, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Nehemiah's prayer is, is twofold. One, that Israel's ways would change. He says, the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name. You know, the Bible says the beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. And so when we pray, when, when we go to the Lord, our desire needs to be that our will, our mind, our view of things would bend and change and become what the Lord's is, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, not that earth's will would be done in heaven. A lot of people get that confused. They, they pray, Lord, do what I want, essentially. Nehemiah says, Lord, I pray that we do what you want. And as that happens, he says, please grant mercy. Mercy is an incredible thing. It's on the same coin, but on the other side uh, would be mercy, and then there is um, grace. Mercy and grace, and grace and mercy, and they go together like peanut butter and jelly. They are exactly opposite, but they are essentially the same. In science, it's in chemistry, it's called a chiral opposite. It's literally, they're the same, but they're different, exactly different. Like your left hand and your right hand are exactly the same, but they're exactly opposite. That's a chiral opposite. Well, grace and mercy are exactly the same in a spiritual sense. Grace gives us the things that we don't deserve. It gives us forgiveness. It gives us another chance. It gives us um, you know, an opportunity to be redeemed. And mercy says we're not going to get the stuff we do deserve. That God's going to have mercy and he's going to give us time and he's going to allow us to repent and come back to him. And so he says just grant mercy in the sight of this man. He knows they don't deserve it. That's the whole purpose of mercy. The whole purpose is that you can't earn it. The purpose is it can't be repaid. And he says, look, we don't deserve this, Lord. Every one of us, including me, has had a role to play in our situation. We, you warned us. You told us what would happen. We did it anyway. So please, he says, just have mercy. For I was the king's cupbearer, the most trusted servant of the king. The man who has the king's ear. I mean, this is about all that Nehemiah can do right now is pray. He lives in Babylon. He hasn't gone home with the others. He's never seen this city. All he's done is heard a headline. Oh, it's going terrible for them. So what does he do? He says, well, all I can do is pray, but that's not nothing. I mean, that's a powerful thing. When you pray and you bend God's ear and you 
incline his ear toward you and you say, Lord, I, I know that this is deserved, but will you have mercy? Will you have grace? Will you receive us back? It's a powerful tool that we have. And so Nehemiah prays. And it begins in chapter 2. That, by the way, is a record. I don't know if we've ever got to chapter 2 in the first night. And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. So remember, we were in the month of Chislev, which is November, December. Nisan is uh, historically the month of Easter or the time of Easter. It's right around March and April. So I know in our calendar that looks like the year had you know, gone over one because they went past December, but that's not how they did years. So they're still in the same year. But for us, it's the difference between November, December, all the way to March and April. So understand that this has been like four months. Nehemiah has been praying for three, maybe four months, these things. He's been going to God every single day, four months of petitioning the Lord, four months of of praying, four months of fasting, four months that he's been just burdened by the need in Jerusalem, a need that he can't do anything about. But God has put this on his heart, and sometimes he does that. He gives us a burden, and he doesn't tell us exactly how it is we're going to fill that or fulfill that. He doesn't tell us what the solution is going to be, but he starts inclining our hearts and our minds toward a certain work. And it could be that, you know, God is doing that in your life. And for some reason now, all of a sudden, you're thinking, you know, I care a lot about this thing. I don't know why, but I care a lot about this. And then I want to see this happen. And, and I, I can't explain it. I've never been there. I don't know those people. But that need is pulling at the strings in my heart. And so then Nehemiah starts praying, Lord, have mercy on them. That's about all I can ask for. He doesn't know what to do, but certainly in these prayers, he's asking for guidance. And, you know, Lord, show me what you want me to do. You didn't make me feel this way about this for no reason. You're prepping me for something, but what is it? So for four months, this has been going on. Keep that in mind. It's the month of Nisan. It's four months, the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. When wine was before him. Now remember, Nehemiah is the cupbearer, the wine before the king. This is like, this is his job. You have one job, Nehemiah, and here it is. Well, he's about to do his job. So wine was before him. So he's in the presence of the king. He's in his official capacity. He's got all his regalia on. He's got his, you know, his, his, his dark sunglasses and he's talking into his cuff. And, you know, he's making sure that everybody's protected and and the king is secure. He's running the show. Wine was before him that I took the wine and gave it to the king. It went through Nehemiah. He tasted it. He didn't die. Okay, the king can have it. Now, I had never been sad in his presence before. Therefore, the king said to me, why is your face sad since you're not sick? This is nothing but sorrow of heart. That seems like a very minor statement, but understand that being sad in the presence of the king of Babylon was punishable by death. It really was. You might remember to the beginning of the book of Daniel, when Daniel was young and he had first been taken to Babylon, and they said, okay, here's the king's food. And Daniel and his friends said, no, we're not going to eat the king's food because we're not going to contaminate our body and defile ourselves with something that's been sacrificed to idols. And so you can change our name and change our clothes and change our address and change our language and make us do all this, this work, but you're not going to change, you're not going to corrupt us from within. We're, we're going to have a barrier here. That's a line we don't cross. We're not going to eat that food. But you remember what was wrong. And the problem with it was, was the guy that was in charge of Daniel and the others were worried Because the chief, it says, of of the eunuchs was there with Daniel. And he said, I fear my lord, the king, who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would be you would endanger my head before the king. The king doesn't want to see sad people in his court. You know, you're sad. Go home and work that out. But don't bring that into the king's court. If uh, you need to go drink a little bit more wine, Nehemiah, then do that and cheer up. But get over it before you come to the king. He doesn't want to hear your problems. 
He doesn't want to hear anything about this. And so if people showed up sad and, and downcast, it could be punished by death. I mean, that was the fear of the guy that was in charge of Daniel, was that if Daniel showed up and he looked worse and he looked downcast and looked malnourished, that the king wouldn't just punish Daniel, but punish the guy that was in charge of making Daniel look good. So Nehemiah knows this. This is not like just a made-up thing. It's not just a myth or a legend or something we say because they're ancient people. It was really a capital offense to do that in the king's presence. So Nehemiah is there, and he's, he's feeling sad. And so it says, so I became dreadfully afraid because he knew that he could be killed for this very thing. And I said to the king, may the king live forever. You know, I, I might lose my head, but, you know, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies waste and its gates are burned with fire? Then the king said to me, what do you request? So here it is. Nehemiah has been praying, okay, uh, Lord, give, us, give me an opportunity. Open a door for me. You made me feel awful about the plight of the Jews in Jerusalem. They're not necessarily people I know, but I feel this burden. You've never given me an opportunity to do anything about it. Here it is. Here's the king. What do you request? <laughs> so I prayed to the God of heaven. It's a good place to be. Notice it's not the first prayer, though. This is like the 160th prayer. He's, he's prayed for, for four months. You know, he, he's been praying, or the 120th prayer. He's, he's been praying for a long time. You know, a lot of people, when, when they're in that moment, that's the first prayer. And they go, okay, Lord, get me through this. But that's the first time they brought it up to God. Well, Nehemiah, this is on the back of three, four months of praying every single day, twice a day, as often as he can, fasting and mourning and weeping and just praying, Lord, open a door, praying, Lord, give me the opportunity, give me the boldness, give me the courage, help me to recognize it when it shows up. And so here's the king saying, okay, what do you want, Nehemiah? How can we fix this problem? And so he says, okay, Lord, here we go. Give me the words. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Then the king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him. Now that's an interesting detail, the queen sitting beside him. In Babylonian public affairs. In fact, in all ancient public affairs, the women weren't there. The queen would never have sat beside the king in a royal court. It wasn't like they ruled, you know, king and queen, like you see the king of England and the queen, or the queen of England and before, you know, the, the king. And you don't see them hand in hand ruling as a duo. This isn't a team effort. In ancient days, you know, the queen was, was out of the picture. You remember that was the whole big issue with Esther. She was the queen. She was married to the king. But she couldn't approach him and be in his presence without being summoned first. So she was really worried about going to him and telling him all about the, 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 the plot that she'd unfolded uh, about exterminating all of the Jews because she goes, look, if I go in there and he doesn't want to see me, I'm going to be killed. And, and her father says, well, you were made for a time such as this. So the queens were never there with the king. The fact that she is there means they're not in their royal court. Probably they're at home. They're in their living room. They could be in their bedchamber. I mean, this is the private residence. This is, you know, this is the east wing of the White House. This is where the president goes when the office stuff is done and he goes home to be with his family and there's that secret service guy that goes with him and he escorts him all the way home and he's there and he serves and he has an ear. But, but that's what Nehemiah has. He's in the private chambers of the king. The queen is there. This is a very intimate conversation. This isn't a public address. He's not bringing this up in front of everybody. He waits for the right moment. But that's where they are. The queen is there, so they're at home. How long will your journey be, he says, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. So he says this is about how long it'll be. Um, that there's going to be a number of, 
of days that it will take to rebuild this wall. In fact, uh, he's going to do it in 52 days is how long Nehemiah is going to take to rebuild the wall. But he gave him a time. He said, I'll be back by the fall or, you know, whenever. Furthermore, I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to me for the governors of the region beyond the river that they must permit me to pass through till I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he must give me timber to make beams for the gates of the citadel which pertain to the temple for the city wall and for the house that I will occupy. And the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. If you're going to pray to God, be bold. Lord, give me an opportunity. Well, what do you need? Um, well, truth is, I need everything. I need timber. I need passports. I need money. I need all of it. And I'm, I'm going to ask a big prayer. You know, God can't answer with a big answer if we don't ask a big prayer. And so a lot of people, they go to God and they say, Lord, just give me a little bit. Just give me a morsel. Just give me a tidbit. Nehemiah, he goes to the king and he says, you know, I, I need all of it. I need your forest. I need passway. I, I, he's going to send him a military escort so that he gets there safely. I need you to give me letters of marquee so that when I get there, I show them and I have the seal of the king that says we're going to rebuild the city and they have to do what I say. I need all of the things. I mean, this is a bold request. This isn't something that you go timidly. And I think very often when people pray to the Lord and they pray timidly, it's, it's usually out of a lack of faith. You know, if I ask for a lot, you know, there's no way God's going to do that. If I ask, Lord, um, provide me everything that I need. That's a big request. And, and there seems to be that there's a lot of room for failure in that. Because if I say, Lord, give me everything that I need and I don't get everything. Well, you know, then the prayer didn't work. So why don't I just kind of keep it nice and neat and small, something easy something that God can easily grant, or in a lot of people's minds, something that could easily happen anyway, so that my faith isn't really tested all that much. But the truth is, big faith prays big prayers, which get big answers from the Lord. And, and so Nehemiah has a big faith. He's been praying for this moment for months. And he goes to the king and he says, I need it all. And the king granted them to me. And his, his prayer was answered. I love that the Bible reminds us so many different times. It doesn't matter who the king is. It doesn't matter who the president is. It doesn't matter who the governor is. It doesn't matter who's the richest person in the world and who has you know, all the jobs and who has the most of something and who controls the oil and who has the biggest army. Daniel tells us that God puts governors and leaders in place and that he moves them and he removes them. He sets them up and he tears them down. In the book of Romans, it tells us that he works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Well, Nehemiah has been called. Nehemiah loves the Lord. God's going to move mountains for him because it doesn't matter who occupies the throne at any given time. God occupies the real throne. And he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he can turn anybody any which way that he wants, and it doesn't matter who they are. It can be the leader of North Korea, it can be the president of the United States, or the king of England. It doesn't matter who it is. If God wants those resources to be brought to bear on this cause, it's going to happen. I was talking to somebody just the other day, and he was telling me a story of how he went about planting a church that he pastored for a long time. And he said that he was in this town, he'd never lived there before, but he just felt the Lord calling him to this particular place to plant a church. He didn't know the first thing about church planting. He'd never done it before, but he just felt God and his wife affirmed it. They believed God had called them to this town to plant this church, only they didn't know how. And so it had been about a year and he was working a job and he said that he was just down by himself, you know, one day, just kind of praying near a park, kind of near a river. And he was in the word and he was just seeking the Lord. And he said, you know, Lord, you called me here to plant this church, but I don't know what I'm doing. And nothing's happened. So uh, I, I don't know if I got it wrong or, or what, but I need you to do something here because I'm running out of ideas. 
And he said that God spoke to him so clearly in that moment that he told them, or he told him, I want you to go to this particular business and I want you to tell them that you're here to plant a church. There is a room above that business and they're going to give you that room for free and I want you to plant in that room. Now, he'd never been to this business. He didn't even know what it was. Sure enough, he looked it up and there it was. There was a business there. He went to there. Uh, well, he, not at first. He went home <clears throat> and his wife said, so anything happened today? And he goes, well, actually, you know, I think the Lord told me to go over here and ask them about a room, but I've never been there before. I don't even know if they have a room. I don't know if this is a one-story building. I don't know if this is out of business. I have no idea, but I think God has called us to plant a church, and it seems like he's sending me here. So he just kind of let it go because he was worried that he was wrong and he didn't want to be embarrassed. So he goes to work the next day, and his friend asks him, so how's that church plant going? And well... Uh, he says, you know, it's uh, not going all that well. I don't have a place, and I don't have any people, and I don't know what I'm doing. And he said, well, you know what? I heard that there's this business, and that they have a room, and they might give it to you for free. It was the same exact establishment that he had felt the Lord call him to. So he says, you know what? I got to go. And he went, and he went to that business, and he walked in the door, and he said, you know, we've never met but this is my name, and, and I'm here, and you know, we think God's called us to plant a church. And I'm just wondering, do you have a room upstairs that we can use? And he says, oh, yeah, we do. It's a stock room up there. And you know what? I'm not a believer, but I love your heart. You guys can meet in there for free all you want. And he planted the church. And within five to six years, that church was 150 people. God can move resources. He can move people. And it doesn't matter if you've ever heard of that place or not. If God has called you, he has already worked it out. He's ordered the steps. He's got it there. He's going to bring it to bear on the cause that he's directed. He will move mountains. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And so here it says, the king granted them to me. Everything belongs to the Lord's and he will use it as he determines. You know, so many people get upset. Well, Jeff Bezos has all the money. No, he doesn't. Jeff Bezos is the name on the account, but God owns the cattle on a, th on a thousand hills. And if he wants Jeff Bezos' money to go plant a church, then Jeff Bezos' money is going to go plant a church. And if God wants so-and-so to go start a church, and so-and-so is going to start. And if he wants a room above this business, there's going to be a room above this business. And if he wants Nehemiah to have the Babylonian king's forest to go build the walls around Jerusalem, that's exactly what's going to happen. And so the king granted them to me according to the good hand of my God upon me. What a profound statement. You know, how many times do we do something... And it goes well, and we start thinking pretty highly of ourselves, but, but how many times you know, do we stop and think, you know what, it's only because of the good hand of my God upon me. I couldn't have done this on my own. I don't know what I'm doing. Nehemiah is a cupbearer. He's, he's not a military leader. He's not an engineer. He's not a city planner. He's never built a wall in his life. You know what he does? He picks up a cup, and he sips it, and he hands it to the king. That's his life. And yeah, he's got some power and prestige. He's got a name and some things. He's never done anything like this. He doesn't organize people. He doesn't know the thing, first thing about project management or architectural structure or military fortifications or organizing a whole group of people or leading a nation. He has no idea what he's doing. But the good hand of his God is upon him. And God will lead him, and he will give him everything that he needs, including the Babylonian king's resources. Then I went to the governors in the region beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. So here comes the contingent. He's not just going alone. He's not just going with money and letters, and he's not just going with the king's support. He's going with the king's military. When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonites official heard of it. They were deeply disturbed that a man had come to seek the well-being of the children of Israel. We're going to find out who these two people are. Uh, Sanballat and Tobiah will become basically the biggest naysayers in this whole thing. Tobias, or Tobiah 
is going to be, well, I should say Sanballat is going to be the enemy from, from without. Um, well, I'm sorry, no, Tobiah is going to be the enemy from with, without. He's the enemy that's, you know, he's a Babylonian. He's not part of the inner circle. He's, he's the, the naysayers in the, in the world that are saying it's never going to work. But Sanballat is a little bit different. He's a man that's married into the Jewish population and into the culture. He has Jewish roots. And so while he should be one of Nehemiah's biggest cheerleaders, he's going to become his biggest enemy. And there are always going to be people like this out there. And, you know, it's one thing to contend against the Tobias of the world. You know, the ones that are out there. They don't know what you're doing. They're not believers. They, they don't see it the way you see it. They're calling you names. You know, that, that's one thing. But then to be attacked by the people from within, that's really hard. And, you know, there, there's been times in my ministry where there's just been attacks from people within the fellowship. I mean, not outside. We get that all the time. But I'm talking about within the fellowship, the people that you're there and you're caring for and you're pouring out to. And, and they show up, but they just want to tear it all down. And, and you're just thinking, wow, that really hurts. I mean, we're part of the same family. We're going to be in heaven together. And yet here on earth, this is what it's like. And so there's going to be people like that in your life as well. People that you never know that are out there wishing you'll fail. I mean, okay, they're always there. But then there's going to be people in your inner circle and your family, even friends, who are going to surprise you. And they're going to be the ones who try to stand in your way or they become your enemies. It makes me think of the time that Jesus told the apostles that he was going to go to the cross and Peter, who was like on cloud nine at the time because of the great confession, you know, he had just said, well, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, my father in heaven told you that. Blessed are you above others, Simon. And so, you know, Simon Peter's on cloud nine because of that. And then Jesus says he's going to the cross. And, and Peter says, far be it from you, Lord, that shall never happen to you. And you remember what Jesus said to Peter? He said, get behind me, Satan. And I just imagine, you know, having that come from Peter. Jesus recognized right away the voice of the enemy coming through Peter. Not that Peter was actually Satan or that Jesus hated him, but he recognized that the enemy will use people close to us to try to discourage and tear down. And, and boy, that, that really can be, can be difficult. And so he's going to have these two. And they're going to come and they're going to try and get in his way. And, and there will always be enemies in the way. There will always be people who want the work to fail. But here's the thing that they don't know. But you do. If God has called you to it, there ain't nothing that's going to cause it to fail. If he's called you to the work, then he's going to give you the king's forest. And he's going to give you the king's captains. And he's going to give you the king's money. And he's going to give you the king's rite of passage. And he's going to give you the king's leave. And he's going to use the Babylonians to fund the reconstruction of Jerusalem. You know, these are the people that sacked it in the first place. And now they're going to pay to rebuild it. There will be enemies in the world. But, you know, Jesus said, and he said it well, I will build my church, he said, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. And so Sanballat and his, his little crony Tobiah and the others that will come alongside them, they don't know what Nehemiah knows, and that is that, his, that the good hand of his God is upon him. And when God calls you to something, you can believe that the good hand of your God is upon you. And enemies or no, he will bring to bear in your life and in your ministry and in your work all the things that you need to succeed. And there will be obstacles and there will be challenges. But the good hand of your God is upon you. And that's where we're going to close for this week and we'll continue picking up with verse 11 next week heavenly father we thank you that your good hand is upon us but as we gather here tonight and we consider the life of nehemiah the man that that you called lord to do this mighty work he's, he's not a person that anybody would have looked at and thought that that he would build the walls around jerusalem but yet lord 
You don't necessarily call the equipped. You equipped the called and you put this burden on his heart and you opened the door and you provided him everything that he needed to go and succeed and overcome the enemies that will come in front of him. And Lord, we read this and it reminds us of just how faithful you are even in our own lives to provide what we need in the moment that we need it. And sometimes we pray for months and we wait for that door, but then there it is, Lord. And in that moment, you bring to bear all the resources and all the needs and and all the supplies and all the courage and all the boldness that we need to do the thing that you have called us to do. So, Lord, as we leave here, I just pray that that we would go with that kind of boldness, that we would go like Nehemiah's into the world, understanding that we're not always going to be the one that other people would think are called to the work, but, Lord, you've put it on our heart and we know that the good hand of our God goes with us and whatever we need you have already prepared if we need a home if we need money if we need people if we need time whatever it is Lord that you have them there ready and waiting so Lord I just ask that as we go from here we would keep that in mind keep us safe Lord as we go into the cold and we drive home in the dark and just ask that You would bless each and every one of us, get us home safely, and bring us back again next week to continue in Nehemiah as we study in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you on Wednesday. Well, Sunday and then Wednesday.